Hi, y'all. Welcome back. We're in um, the last part of week nine. We have some stuff coming up that I wanted to talk about. So today's Wednesday. Uh, I do want to do one last, uh, maybe a, a half hour to 45 minutes to finish up our introduction to IEEE 754. Um, and then the, less, the rest of class will be finishing our discussion of uh, plots, graphics, subplots, and all this. And then hopefully next week we will get into um, how to uh, write and read data. We saw a little bit about the idea of CSV read, which was comma separated variable file, how to import it, how to manipulate it, etc. cetera. Um, I, I want to get into like sprintf, which is kind of um, C programming-esque. And uh, also talk about how to like, if you create data in MATLAB, how do you write that to different files? So you could write it as a .mat file, you could write it as a .csv file. And I do want to introduce that to you. Um, I do have some announcements. I think we have some due dates coming up, right? Um, lab four is due uh, Monday of next week. So I suppose that's going to be the ninth. Uh, exam one corrections. Are due on Monday the 9th. We have uh, exam one corrections forms. I printed these out today. They're available right up for you here. Uh, so if you wanted to come grab those later. So this is the exam one corrections forms. They're 10 pages. There's some reflection questions. And then also uh, we have the lab four prompt. Some of you uh, might not want to print that for yourself. And I do want that at the front of every lab that you submit. So those are available for you there. I will have some updates on the exam corrections process that hopefully I'll talk about later today. But I wanted to announce that I finally got those, those done. Any questions about the, how the class is progressing or things that we should be conscious of as we're, as we're moving forward today? At some point, I have a question for some of you. How, how's the streaming going? Just to make sure for those of you that need it, that you have it. Um, all right, so we're going to finish this up today, and then we're going to move on from IEEE format. I'm very proud of our introduction. You all have got to see the insides of what double precision means. Um, OK, so let's do a quick recall. If y gets stored as uh, any suggestions, binary 32 or binary 64? 64. 32, 60, OK, yeah. Uh, well, we could do both, actually. Binary 32. Uh, let's do 1 tenth for now. Um, and then why don't we take, um, we'll call that Y1, and we'll call Y2 binary 64. And I think we could try, we haven't done, the, uh, uh, what is it called again? Uh, denominator 7, really, at all. Um, so what if we did like, Eight hundred twenty one plus three divided by seven. That one's a brutal. Um, I, I just realized why we don't do denominators of seven <laughs> for hand calculations. Uh, I don't know if we want to keep it. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and look at this. So if I look at Y1, what was the claim of the structure of this? How many total bits are assigned to Y1? 32. Uh, yeah, so it's the, the top one we're going to call position 31. Do you remember what we said about the number of bits that were dedicated to the exponent? Eight, yep. 
So this goes down to B23. And then here we've got 23 bits to the significant. All right. Um, and then we also said that we could write this as mathematically a sign. In normalized numbers, we could write it as 1 plus the fractional part, which we call the significant, times 2 to the exponent value. Um, in this case, I'm actually going to call this exponent 1 and fraction 1 because we have two different uh, values there. And we could actually write this as like negative 1 to the sine bit times 1 plus the fractional component 2 times exponent 1. Um, I actually don't want to do this one. I, I haven't had the time to actually sit down and do this example out. I was just thinking about it on my drive to work today. Um, so I don't want to do this live in class because I think, unless, so, does somebody have a, a very quick way to convert 3 sevenths into binary fractions? This is going to be a type 2 number in both uh, base 10 and base 2, right? Would 9 work? You could change the 7 to a 9 with just a little. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, we could try 9. It's still infinite, but it's not as bad, huh? It may be that our old one works on that. Okay, so I'm going to let you all, here's a challenge for you. Please convert this number into binary 32 and I want the 32 bit string with appropriate rounding. So that's a challenge to you. As you're doing that I'm going to prep the next part of today.
Has anybody got it? I mean, one way to do this is really easy, right? So I'm going to let you all finish that. If you haven't yet finished, I'm going to let you finish it uh, in your own time. Uh, this is a way you can check yourself. Uh, literally what I did is I ran the code um, format hex on a single, I typecast it as a single. So I typecast the number one over 10 as a single. That means I have 32 bits done in floating point. Formax hex and then MATLAB is going to produce the string of bits here. The thing I wanted to talk about today is relevant to the following problem. So if I, uh, we've, we've made the claim, so let's go ahead and format long, that I can use MATLAB to do something like this, right? Four times uh, 43 divided by seven. And then we've made this claim that MATLAB is going to give me an accurate representation within some certain number of digits of the output of that, right? 
but that claim is based on what I would call a numerical algorithm running in the background. It is the most basic numerical algorithm of all computation. And in fact, it represents the, um, what I would call maybe the, um, the basis of all digital computation. So uh, we're, we're gonna make a claim here. On a digital computer, uh, sorry, not a digital, a binary computer, we've learned, this is not just MATLAB that does this, by the way. Um, almost every, anybody taking Python, C, Anybody taking Fortran? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, every programming language under the sun and all, um, all the manufacturers that, are, that make these actually uh, implement IEEE format. So it's not the case that what you're learning here is distinct to MATLAB. MATLAB is our introduction to this concept. Um, we've learned how to store um, input variables in floating point. The next chapter, and we are not going to get into this this quarter. In fact, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I want to talk about it today so that you're aware of it. Um, but this is actually what I would call a numerical analysis class, or it introduces the con some of the concepts that are fundamental in numerical analysis of learning. Here would begin with a discussion of operations. Could you guess some of the operations that we would want to start with? Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ad addition of two floating points. What else? Subtraction, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and, and for now I'm gonna focus on two. I'm gonna focus on what we call addition. Subtraction we're gonna think about as the counterpart. It is a different algorithm, but it's very much related to that. And can you guess what the other one that I'm gonna focus on? Multiplication. Division, yeah, and those two, those are worth talking about. There's actually entire circuits that just accomplish those things. But what I wanted to say was um, these two operations actually set a foundation for all numerical computation. So through Taylor series polynomials, one of the claims is that um, in Taylor series polynomials, we transform uh, functions into infinite sums, right? That's the major idea there. That's actually the base idea behind when you type in sine of x. So if I go over to my uh, this thing and I type in sine of, of, I don't know, 3. MATLAB is not doing some crazy trigonometric identity um, with the concept of sine, what MATLAB is doing is literally transforming sine into an infinite sum, approximating that in the theoretical part of it, approximating that infinite sum by a finite number of, of summations, and then giving a numerical approximation for that in terms of the, uh, what that approximation says. And this is one of those, uh, the funny thing about this is you could actually format hex So there is an algorithm that MATLAB, the same thing is true here, right? If I take the square root of two, MATLAB is actually running an algorithm that at its heart, way deep down in the bowels of the, of the, of the computer is based on the, these four operations, addition, multiplication, division, and 
subtraction, right? And so it approximates the value of this output using those operations. Then when it gets the approximation appropriately, it writes that approximation to the output on that and stores it as a floating point number. So this is one of the reasons that I said that um, floating points are kind of the, the currency of all numeric computation because behind the scenes here, MATLAB is really relying very, very heavily on algorithmic approaches to this, and you all now have seen that. The, what I wanted to show today, we're actually going to start with one that seems more difficult, but it ends up that the uh, math behind it becomes a lot easier. So let's imagine we have these two floating point numbers. So let's let y be equal to some, I don't know, it doesn't really matter what it is. Let's call it floating point of y. So in this case, we'll let y be a real number. So what do I mean by this? Where are these, how much data is in, could possibly encoded in these two numbers right there? What type of objects are they? Are they math objects or coding objects? Those are math objects. It could be pi, it could be e, it could be one over seven. These things have, could have possibly an infinite number of, number of decimal digits. The, mom, the moment I hit y1 with a float of why? What do I mean by that? Transform the math object into a coding object. And in particular, we're going to co code it as a floating point representation, either binary 62 or uh, binary 32 or 64. Could you guess what we'll do here? Let's convert the math object. I don't know how we do that. That's an open question. So we're going to convert the math object y2 into a corresponding computer science or a numeric numerical representation of that in a binary computer. And then what we want to do is find y1. times y2. And I'm going to be really, really careful here. <laughs> Any, so one thing that is definitely true When the moment I convert a math object into a floating point object, I have some error there, right? Okay. So not, neither of my actual computer science uh, objects that are supposed to approximate the original number underneath are exact. Moreover, when I implement an algorithm on a computer, that's not the same thing as doing this by hand. And this is a really interesting concept that I could actually take the original two numbers that I actually store in my computer, I could multiply those by hand and I get an output. And that's not the same output that I'm going to get when I store the output of that calculation done on a computer. So the reason that I want to talk about this though is let's think about what this would actually look like. So let's do first the operation in math world, not in computer world. What did we know about each individual um, floating point number? How is it stored? Well, the first floating point number would be stored as a sign times a mantissa times an exponent. And then I'm going to take that entire thing and what am I going to do with it?
I'm going to multiply by another one. So in particular, I'm going to have this thing called negative 1 to the sine times a different mantissa. times an exponent. Okay, so kind of work through this. What happens to the signs there? When is it positive? When is it negative? So let's go ahead and, and actually just do a table here. So we'll call this S1, we'll call this sine 2, and we'll call this, I don't know what we want to call the output here, maybe you call that the sine of the output. So, we'll call that sine 1, sine 2, and the sine of the output. So, if the first one's positive and the second one positive, what's the third one? Positive. First one's positive, second one's negative, output is? Negative. First one's negative, second one's positive, output is? Negative. Negative, negative positive in terms of the binary representation if I multiply two zeros together I should get a zero if I multiply a zero and a one I want a one because one represents negative right one and a zero I want a one one and a one I want a zero this thing is very very famous it's called an exclusive OR. That's what that's called. That's called an XOR. Because literally, if one is true or the other is true, but not both are true, that's the truth table that comes out of that. So in particular, when we multiply, we would run an exclusive OR on the two sine bits. And then here, what happens to the exponents? So just go back to your math career. What do we do to the two exponents there? You add them. So literally what I would do is I would add the two values of these exponents together and we're going to see that in just a second. And then what would be in here? Yeah, it's just the uh, two of these things multiplied by each other and then shifted. And so one of the claims that we're making here is when we do this multiplication underneath, deep in the, in the bellies of the, of the beast, we run a quick check to, to literally check these two bits and we say to ourselves like, okay, we're going to run an exclusive OR on those. So the output is either one or zero depending on what these start with. At some point, we actually didn't do this in this class. It's something that I would really like to do. There are um, entire circuitries designed to do multiplication. So we would actually multiply these two things. We would, we would run these two strings of digits through a multiplication circuit. And then this one's really interesting. These sums, do they happen in the exponent field or do they happen in the exponent value? Those are happening in the exponent value. And what's really interesting about that is each of those exponent values is the value of the exponent field minus the corresponding bias. Yeah, is that what you said? Yeah. So when I add those two things together, if I take the exponent field one and I add exponent field two, so this is now U1 minus U, uh, UK plus U2 minus UK. But what do you notice about those two things? Yeah, which is not quite what we want, right? Here, this is a pure addition of binary integers in the same way that you did in your 
uh, in your original thing, but this thing we're actually taking two away from the bias, right? And so what's really interesting about that is when we implement that multiplication, what ends up happening is we want to find the sum of those, but we only want to subtract by one bias. And so that's where, when you're actually doing this, when I'm actually doing this, when I'm writing code that uses multiplication, one of the things that's kind of useful if I want to know when things go wrong is to be able to map it back and get back into the original exponent. We're not going to go deep into this, but I wanted to talk about this at least out loud so that you recognize when you hit that little time symbol, there's a lot going on there, right? The, the second thing that I want to talk about, I'm not going to test you on this. I wanted to expose you to the ideas. We're not even going to go into an example because it would literally take three hours and there's other stuff on my mind today. The entire focus of this conversation is to say the following. The moment that we know what floating points are encoded as, we can have a deep discussion of the corresponding arithmetic properties that floating point operations have. For those of you that are interested in this subject, later in my career, I plan to have uh, a, a high number of um, activities involved in floating point operations. For now, because I'm only very young in my teaching career for this particular class, I wanted to show you something on our website. If you're interested in this type of topic, you can go much deeper on in your future. This is uh, the actual uh, most recent version of the IEEE 754 format. So uh, if you actually wanted to read the document, I've, I've read this three times. I've never uh, finished reading it because it's quite deep. Three different multiple month long segments playing with this thing. So it's there for you. There's, uh, it would be really nice. Yeah, there's the contents. So you can actually see, this is the actual contents that runs the manufacturing of all floating point units for manufacturers that actually converge on this. So if you want to get access to that, I, I link it here. You can also Google it. There's a nice online calculator that allows you to kind of get a sense of what's happening here. So if I put one, t Right? I could do uh, 2.3. I could add them. <laughs> kind of nice, right? Uh, I had, at some point, I thought about the idea that I would have, I would force my students to code this in MATLAB. <laughs> it's not going to be this quarter. You're okay. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to show you was there's this really famous paper, um, at least it's been famous in in my world, um, I had a, uh, one of my operations research teachers. We were in math uh, 226A, 226B, and then math 251, I think, their graduate level uh, optimization. Um, a prerequisite for that class was this paper. So one of the funny things about mathematical algorithms that are implemented on computers, which I would claim that's all of MATLAB, um, the people that code those have to understand how computers do MATLAB, uh, do IEEE format. And so what's funny is the IEEE, this is written for electrical engineers that want to implement uh, IEEE standard on hardware. This thing is written for computer scientists who are trying to understand the uh, impact of that hardware implementation on the actual work that they're doing mathematically. So that's available for you. And then there's also a very, very good book on this subject by a guy named Overton. I've read this book fully. I have solutions for almost every exercise in the book myself. Here it is. Uh, I, I link to Siam because, uh, do you see it? No, yeah, there it is. Uh, no, it's not there. Okay, well if you took this name and put it into Google or DuckDuckGo, that's that book. I was just looking at this last week. Yeah, this is a really good one too. These get you into, um, okay, so here's, here's some lore for you. You all have heard of Google, right? 
Larry Page and Sergey Brim gave stock options to Gene Golub, who was the uh, kind of the father of, I mean, a, a guy that wrote really, really heavily in this field on how to implement because Larry Page and Sergey Brim didn't know how, what the best way to implement their PageRank algorithm was on a computer. And so these guys got paid for their expertise to be able to take the material that Larry Page and Sergey Brim had created at, in terms of mapping the internet and actually implement it on a digital algorithm in a, in a, in a computer, right? So I, I won't go more into that today other than to say you, you all now have an introduction to uh, IEEE format. There are a ton more resources here that we can go into in an introductory class and I will, I will continue to host those for the rest of my time um, doing this. The last thing that I'll say is down on the bottom, we've already talked about the introduc some, uh, introductions to bad numerical comp computation. What I also wanted to show you is that this field, unlike many other classes in uh, your undergraduate, this is a, a very open field. N numeric comp digital computers came in the 1950s. It wasn't until the 1970s that we were manufacturing those um, at scale, LSI, VLSI. And then it wasn't really until the 1980s and 1990s that we, as a community, um, got serious about this. So th this is a guy that works at, uh, I forget the, yeah, te Texas A&M. Uh, he's widely known as one of the most prolific authors in the space of sparse matrices. This guy sits close to my heart because I use this stuff. These are all the people that pay him. because they use his code. So you ever used Google Maps where you zoom in and it has a 3D image? Behind that is this guy's code. Uh, this guy's at UC uh, Berkeley. He, um, he does a lot of stuff with parallel computation. Um, I would say that he's, um, this man's a little bit more in, I mean, they're actually really both industrial. It drives me nuts that these are all white men, but that's part of our dialogue in the United States, right? Um, so anyways, down here there are some links to people that, uh, some of these people I actually know, this guy, I helped him write his uh, letter of, um, his teaching letter, so, um, and then some of these other people are, are world famous numerical analysts that are currently still working, and the reason that I wanted you to have access to this is, some of you might actually be interested in doing, using some of this in your future, and these are iconed in the field. If I, if I say Abe Lincoln, have you heard that name before? Okay. If you say these names to me, it is the equivalent to saying Abe Lincoln to somebody that studied uh, American history. The difference is that all of these people are alive and they're still working on these fields. This may be, I don't know, this may be the first class that you've taken that you could build a career in. I don't know that you could build a career from Math 1C material in and of itself. Um, there's kind of a nice, um, so let me do this. This is more of an advertisement than it is lecture, but I do want to talk about it, right? We only have a, a week and a half left. Once you're done with this class, you could never touch MATLAB again. That is a reality. However, if you choose that reality, my claim is, that's a choice that you'll be limited by. So this is an example of a guy that runs a, I don't know how much he's paid for this, but he runs a blog on MATLAB, matlabtips.com. It's pretty good. I like it most for the advanced stuff. He talks about some stuff in his, yeah, check this out. Rounding errors. You all now, you all have a more sophisticated idea of what this means than most undergraduates that I've ever met. And then um, I was just working this morning, and I forget where this was. Was it? Reparenting. Changing children. Let me, let me do this real quick. child swapping.
Oh yeah, Yair Altman. Okay. I forget his blog right now. So let's do MATLAB tips. child swapping. We're going to talk about this today as we do graphics. And there it is. Okay. So this guy makes a living and I think it's a nice living to be honest with you, writing MATLAB code and helping other people write MATLAB code. So you can, you can actually read this. You can read about his, his experience. You can, you can literally read about this about all this stuff. He wrote a book on the subject. He's got a bunch of cool articles. These are, this guy, he's actually current, right? When's the last time he wrote? April? It's not bad. So the reason that I wanted to show you, though, is that there's no way in hell that in 12 weeks I'm going to get you enough information to use MATLAB in the, for your future. But I, what I want to talk about, for those of you that are computer scientists anyways, you've probably already done this, but I have a number of students in this class that have never taken a computer science class and may never need to take one again. And this conversation right now is dedicated to those people. In this space, there are a lot of options to create career opportunities for yourself and future development that will allow you to do things that you couldn't do without it. And I would encourage you to think really critically about that as you uh, continue your development in MATLAB. So I'm going to shut up about that for now. Um, and we'll get back into MATLAB. So the last thing that we're going to do today, and then next week I think we might actually do some numerical analysis. Um, I think we're going to do some... Yeah. So any questions about that? I have some questions for you all, but I won't ask them now. Say it again. Okay, so uh, what, what did we talk about last time when we, were, when we were looking at MATLAB code? What was the thing that we focused on? We did graphics, right? So we had this concept that if I call this code, if I call the figure code, This figure code gives me access to a handle. And then we have this thing called get fig one. And we can actually figure out what the heck the get command does. So reference page for get. Let's go ahead and open that. So what is what is the get command do? Returns all properties and property values for the graphics objects identified in H dot V structure, right? Which we've talked about last time. Why I wanted to say this is do you remember last time I was telling you that the f if I set this thing when I run this code, this variable here, we think about as a pointer, right? And the reason I want to talk about this is when, so if I, if I run this code, this is not a pointer, this is just a variable. And then I run b equals a. Right now, what's the value of b in memory? One. But then I can, oh, sorry. But then I can change the value of b in memory to two and that doesn't actually affect A, right? So making, making changes to the value of B has nothing to do with making changes to the value of A. But I could do figure test equals fig one. And then I could actually do something like, I wish, I've, let's do this real quick because I kind of forgot right now. Figure properties.
So let's collapse all. And then let's turn let's turn the figure bar off, right? So it would be figure test dot toolbar none. So figure test dot toolbar equals none. Now the crazy thing about that is when I actually look at figure one, check this out. I didn't manipulate, look at this line of code. So let's go ahead and look at this. Here, way back when I created what I call figure one, right? So I said to myself, like, okay, figure one is going to be this thing. So let's go ahead and do this. Okay. So here I say, okay, I want to create a figure. So figure is gonna, this is now, I'm gonna create a child of the screen on MATLAB. And I wanna name that figure, I wanna say that figure is now in variable one. That's a whole data class with a ton of properties, right? Right here I create a new variable called figure test and I set that variable equal to figure one. Now, in the A and B properties, when I was thinking about A and B, if I created a copy of A as B and then I changed B, did that have anything to do with A? No, the moment I created a copy of B, or is of A and B, and then I changed the value of B, A is stuck in memory until I specifically refer it again, right? But in this case, we're not thinking about figure test as a variable. Figure test is a pointer to that data structure. And so what's crazy about that is, when I go change the toolbar option to figure test, guess what also changes? the toolbar option to figure one because figure one and figure test point to the same thing which is an entire data structure in memory that has properties these are just handles so when you heard the word when you hear the word handles in MATLAB the idea of a handle is it's pointing to a space where a bunch of data is stored and I can actually manipulate that data through reference for the handle Ah, uh, we're going to talk about that later today. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we'll get there. We'll get there. So, but what I wanted to show you, though, is in this case, this figure is stored as a data class. And indeed, when I ran that code, the toolbar goes to none because I said, hey, go to where this thing is in memory. Wherever this thing is in memory, go to that spot, go down to the property called toolbar and turn it off. Later today, so in, uh, we're gonna take a break real quick. What I'd love you to do, we're gonna start working with what we call subplots. If you would like a challenge, see if before I see you in just a second. Um, Did I shut it off or something? That's okay. So claim, that doc diagram right there is in a single plot. That's in a single figure. Each of those things, each of those individual plots could have a separate plot within it. So this could be a line, that could be sine, that could be cosine, that could be tangent, right? How do you do that? So the hint that I'm gonna give you before break starts is 
the subplot command allows you to accomplish that type of thing. So I'm going to shut up now. Before I see you next, uh, it's 10.52, I'll start again at 11.02. Before I see you next, my question to you is, can you figure out how to use the subplot command to be able to do this? I will show you how to do that. We're going to write that code together. But if you wanted to see that indeed all of this is learned, go ahead and um, document subplot and then see if you can start doing that.